Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. From the right, I'm Gary Polland. And from the left, I'm David Jones. Tonight we welcome two critical guests if you care about public safety in Houston. First, Houston Police Chief Charles McClellan, and secondly, Houston Fire Chief Terry Garrison. Welcome to both of you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. And hey, thank you, Terry, for that, that, uh, that station with, in blocks of my house, and you know, <laughs> it's doing a fine job. We put it there for you. <laughs> <laughs> let's, talk, let's talk to you first, because you're new to town in a way. And yes, you just sir. recently were uh, uh, selected by the mayor. What do you think recommended you to the job which she said was very important to her because of diversity issues within the department. What, you're, what, what, do you, what did you hear? You know, I really believe it's, it's from the culture I came from, the department that I worked in for so many years. We, uh, we recognize culture, uh, that diversity piece as being very important for all of us. So um, I think as she was looking and shopping around, she has some things in mind, and, and uh, I applied for the position. It seems like we kind of matched up the first time I met her. Um, she, she really uh, said, it's your department, you run it, I'm going to step out of your way, but here are a couple of the issues I care about. I care about diversity, I care about fire, fire safety, I care about public service, and it really matched up with really what I care about. So um, I thought it was a, a pretty good fit. Since I've been there in the organization, what I found is that there's very capable people inside the system. In fact, two of the people that are on my command team were, I guess you could say, competitors in the testing process, but they're great guys, and, and we're a working team now. Is there, is, whenever somebody says that they want to change the culture of an organization in a southern town, <laughs> I think... Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of rednecks are going to lose their job. Is that, is that no. what? <laughs> you know, they, they, they say the best definition of culture I've ever heard is the way things are done around here. And that's the best I've heard. Um, I actually don't see a cultural issue in the, um, in the organization itself. I think every organization nowadays can use some more diversity. I think a more diverse workforce provides a better service. If I'm out and, and I, we have a car accident and, and, and there's people that have um, different diverse languages or even uh, different sexes, then we have that service delivery system that kind of matches that. It seems to work out a little better both for the patient and for the delivery system. Now, Police Chief McClellan, uh, you come a little different to your job. You're, you're an insider. You, you start as a patrolman at HPD and basically, I think, did every job, probably clean bathrooms and probably <laughs> had to do everything over the years. And, and you then were selected as chief. What do you think caused the mayor to pick you? Well, first of all, I think she recognized uh, the capacity of the Houston Police Department to have uh, senior management in charge of the organization. There's many, many people that are capable of being chief of police at HPD, and uh, I think it just came down to a matter of style and comfort with the mayor, and I'm certainly appreciative that she chose me to be in charge of such an outstanding organization. Um, uh, so there's many others over there that certainly they were capable of running the organization besides myself. It was important, I think, at this point to have someone from inside the organization uh, ascend to the chief's position, wouldn't you say? Yes, the mayor was committed to that, and uh, she believed that that was the best uh, alternative or, or best option for, you know, the police chief at that time. And your track record for the first year looks pretty good. The statistics say crime is major crime is down in the city of Houston. Well, we had actually, the men and women at HPD have, have done an outstanding job. This is the first time in, in many years, in over 10 years, that we reduce violent crime in every single category, and some by double digits, and we reduce property crimes in every category. And we see the same trends uh, for the first quarter of uh, 2011. So, we're not only working harder, we're working smarter, and we are doing more with less. Let's, let's have you talk about the city of Houston in a, in a general sense. Uh, there is this demographer and political scientist out at Rice, uh, Steve Kleinberg. And he said we're pretty much evolving, if we don't do something, to a third world city. We're a hub for drugs, hub for illegal guns. We've got massage parlors we can't shut down. What about the quality and life of life in Houston? Is it in decline in your view? You're on the front lines. You know, for, for me, what the fire service has been challenged with over the years is um, we've, been, we've had to evolve our service to, to meet the customer's needs, and, and the Houston Fire Department has done a great job of that. The men and women in the Houston Fire Department started, they, they have the greatest EMS system, started in the 70s and the 80s. It was hazardous materials in the 90s. It was... Um, the t technical rescue because the Oklahoma bombing, and then more recently, in the recent past, it's the homeland defense issues. For us, speaking on that issue, ser social service calls are going to be the big bear on our uh, fire department. That's going to cause us a lot of work. Where do people go 
when they don't have health care, when, when um, they don't know who to call, they call 911, and every time they call 911, they're going to get a fire truck there, or they're going to get a, a fire response when they say they have some sort of emergency. We're going to show up, and we're finding out that most of the calls we go to are urgent for those customers, but not emergencies that you would think of the typical emergency. So that's how it's affecting our business. How do we, how do we work with, the, with our customers and really satisfy their needs? So that sort of, you know, gives uh, uh, weight to the argument that Houston is meeting some tough times in terms of how its citizens are dealing with an economic downturn. And, you know, if, any, if anybody sees it, you would think it would be police officers. Well, we certainly we have made this city safer in the last year and a half. And I can say this, that guns, drugs, all of those have been challenges for police throughout the years. And we've done a very good job. And uh, they're going to be continuing challenges, but we what we do know is the people that are committing crimes and making our neighborhoods and communities unsafe is a small minority, probably about 10 percent or less. Uh, and what we have to keep in mind that police officers are on the front line, but they're actually the entry point of the criminal justice systems. You know, prosecutors, the courts, pro probation, prison systems, all have to do their part too to keep our communities safe. Well, let's talk about uh, the, the, big, uh, the big thing out there, the budget <laughs> issues the city of Houston faces. Uh, the mayor and the city council has had to deal with a significant shortfall in revenue for the city, and, and they've, they've froze, they froze, they, and now they're, I guess, making cuts, making chief you cut, making chief you cut. Uh, what are the implications for the public with these cuts in, in important public safety responsibilities? Well, certainly, uh, when, you, when you look at my particular budget, uh, it's very large. It's the largest uh, budget of out of any city departments, and my general fund budget is somewhere in the neighborhood of $685 million. However, 95% of that is labor or personnel costs, salaries, benefits, compensation packages for my employees, for the 7,000 employees. Now, we have been asked to reduce that budget somewhere in the neighborhood of $39 million. And if we had to stick to those budget numbers in a worst case scenario, yes, we would have to lay off not only civilian staff, but classified officers. And I can tell you this, uh, it certainly will have some impact and some negative impact if I have to pull police officers off the street and have them doing other functions or other, other duties than their primary crime fighting duties. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> under the police standards that we discussed off camera before, uh, Houston, if you follow that formula, ought to have not less officers than we have now. We ought to have about 2,000 more officers working for HPD, assuming there was somebody to pay for it. Well, that, that's true. If, if the standard that you're talking about is 2.8 to 3.0 uh, police officers per 1,000 residents, as some other cities like Chicago, Los Angeles, Philadelphia uh, have similar staffing models, then to bring Houston or the Houston Police Department up to that standard, yes, it would require roughly another 2,000 police officers. And you'd, you'd take those additional officers if somebody paid for them, wouldn't you? Well, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I'm certainly I'm convinced that I won't ever have all the resources that I, I want, but certainly uh, I, I think it's city government and, and the citizens of Houston to give me the resources that I need. And Chief Garrison, you uh, know that there has been an issue within the safety procedures of the Houston Fire Department where, you know, for whatever reason, seven firemen lost their lives in the last decade. Some attribute it to this fast get into that house first and foremost uh, kind of uh, philosophy. You said you're going to continue that, but with a plan to get out of the house. <laughs> what, well, is, what does all that mean? Well, first of all, um, the firefighting is an inherently dangerous business, and firefighters go out best, the fires go out best when you're inside and they're small. So the way we staff our model is that it's all about response times. How can we locate firefighters throughout the community, these all-hazards all responders? In case of a fire, they get there, they're able to get inside that fire with a, with a group of people ready to combat that fire while that fire is still small. The only way to do that is to go inside. I think the Houston Fire Department has done an excellent job. In fact, over my years, over 30 years in Phoenix, I've actually looked towards the Houston Fire Department on how to do things better, and I think most of the country has. It's been unfortunate that some of the fires that we had had some strange uh, critical fire ground factors to them, such as high wind and other issues like that that contributed to some of those firefighters' deaths. 
What I would like to do is I'd like to, and, and we're starting it now, there's a couple of things I want to accomplish, and I've got the entire support of the Houston Fire Department, is a risk-based training. And really, how do you evaluate risk on the fire ground? There's some decision-making models out there, some best practices. There's probably a group of people within the city of Houston, firefighters, what we're finding is that they know what to do. The problem with the size of the Houston Fire Department, how do we create that model out of best practices and then share that. So what we're going through now is a four-step process. That first pro step is to establish those expectations, that risk-based expectations. The second step is to train all our members in that. Third step would be to go out and, and our supervisors actually monitor performance while we apply that. And actually the fourth step is hold people accountable, both good and bad. And I think using that model and processing that throughout the Houston Fire Department, we can become safer firefighters. We are aggressive. I want us to continue to be aggressive. It's kind of like an NFL lineman. The worst thing you could do is to ease up on a tackle. You're going to get hurt. I don't want our firefighters easing up, but I want them to recognize when's the right time to exit the building and and get out prior to the roof coming in. There's, there's some city and uh, police and fire departments in the country where it's, it's a, an obligation for those officers who are working within those departments to live within that city. We don't do that here. Is, do you see that as something that is, uh, should be recommended, that we have actually have people on your staffs and working for you who know the city and live in the city and are experiencing the same issues and problems that the rest of us who live here are? Well, I can only speak for the Houston Police Department, and I can tell you this. As chief of police, I do live in this city, and uh, but I don't think it should be a requirement of my police officers because they base their residency on their financial factors. So I would say that I, I certainly make more money than they do, that if that's going to be a requirement, then certainly the city is going to have to pay them uh, comparable amounts of compensation so that they can afford housing. Yeah, if they all could live in River Oaks, David, I'm sure they would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're living in River Oaks, too? Is uh, no, I live across the loft. Of the, <laughs> across the, uh, the bayou there, off Sabine. I mean, I'm right downtown. But uh, what I would say about that also is that I agree with every, everything you said is I would think we would we would have a problem if our if our workers came in and acted like mercenaries and didn't care about the community. But you can see from all the extra activities that our firefighters do and our police officers, the way we stay connected to this community, it isn't necessarily um, imperative that we live in this community. I mean, we're we're I see firefighters all the time on their days off giving or providing some sort of support to the community. Do you have a general idea about what the percentages are of your force and your force who are living in the city of Houston? Well, I, I really, I certainly wouldn't want to guess, but yeah. I, I echo what Chief Garrison is saying. Um, you know, when people make a decision on where to purchase their homes and live, it's based on not only economic factors, mm -hmm. but school districts, a lot of different factors. So I just think people should have the freedom unless you are the department head, to choose where you want to live. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's talk about the big bugaboo, which, of course, is the money and the budget and, yes. and, and having adequate funding or the sufficient funding for public safety. If you poll the citizens of the city of Houston, you would find that uh, number one and 1A is police and fire protection. Probably number two is going to be infrastructure. And after that, I think it rest of us an afterthought. So the question becomes, given our present difficult economic climate, which looks like it could last for a while, do we have to start looking at alternative ways to fund the priorities that the public has living in the city of Houston? Well, I, I certainly do. I, I think <coughs> that, uh, you know, government certainly has a responsibility to keep its citizens safe. That's the, to me, that is the number one priority of government. And certainly the citizens have to uh, decide how they want to pay for that protection and do uh, make that a priority. Uh, I, I certainly believe that. And if that's identifying additional revenue streams and helping the mayor and city council out, uh, you know, with those ideas, uh, I, I would welcome that. Chief, do you think <clears throat> that uh, in, in your experience, because you didn't come from Houston, but looking around the country, when other areas of the country were having problems funding public safety, they've decided to dedicate a fee for public safety and said we're going to have a public safety fee they took it out let the public decide you want a public safety fee meaning funds from this fee are dedicated 100 percent 
to police and fire protection. I absolutely couldn't agree more. I, I, I really feel that um, everybody says public safety is important until it's time to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And really in our business, um, you, hopefully you never need us, but you really want us there before you call us. So um, what, I've, what I've seen across the country, everybody's struggling in this, with this, is the, everybody says the most important things we do is police and fire within our communities and the infrastructure piece. But I have seen some cases where as it moves forward in the process, we find out how important libraries are and how important parks are. And without proper education, and really that's our role, is to how do we support those politicians so they can go out and educate people so that they can make better decisions. I think that's that's where we play the play the key sounds role. Like, sounds like they are they support the red light cameras again, Gary. Well, <laughs> uh, I, 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 Chief, yes, uh, red light cameras. It, it got, you know, and there's dispute of how effective it was. I, I know the police department and statistics say it is. It got defeated. Uh, what's your take on what happened? Do you think the public really understood what was going on? Well, I, you know, I, I can only tell you what you know voters have told me uh, anecdotally uh, after, in the aftermath, and most people tell me that number one that they do think running a red light is dangerous to cause injuries and fatalities. No one say that that's okay. Two, they do think that <clears throat> there should be some consequences when one runs a red light, but they did not understand. Uh, uh, the significant uh, financial uh, responsibility that goes along with that. And people do tell me, I didn't know what I was voting for. I didn't understand what I was voting for. And I thought elderly senior citizens were going to be spending their medi medication money on paying red light tickets. Well, if you don't run a red light, regardless of who you are, how old you are, you won't get a citation. And the, and the police department was receiving a, a significant share of the revenue from that, was it not? And also trauma centers. Okay. People who are getting so that injured, was good too. Yeah. getting injured that are uninsured would pay for that. But you found that the public, the, the voters at least talked to you who voted against it, regret it now because now after the election they start hearing where the money was really going. Not only the financial piece, but they also understand that part of my core services is traffic enforcement. And I still have to do traffic enforcement, but now instead of doing it with technology, I have to do it with a police officer. And without any additional staffing, those police officers are coming from the neighborhoods where I need them in the neighborhood doing other crime fighting duties. The camera can work 24 hours a day, seven days a week in inclement weather. The police officer can't do that. So you think we ought to revisit it with the voters? I, I certainly uh, wouldn't object to that. <laughs> and if it actually prevents accidents with those in, within those intersections, then it, it, it's something that we would actually support because... Uh, the worst, the worst thing you could do is is go to an accident and pull somebody out of a car and realize that this person is in this condition, and these injuries are caused because somebody else needlessly ran through a red light. That's just tremendous. I've got uh, this recommendation for you, Chief, and see okay. where you go with it. The four, first four months of 2011, HPD arrested 9,000 people for the smallest misdemeanor, county misdemeanor there is. Uh, about 2,000 of those were for grams of marijuana at 250 a pop. That's booking costs of a half a million dollars just in the first four months. Why not have all of those arrests be directed to city of Houston courts where, because there's lesser included crimes in there, paraphernalia, mm -hmm. shoplifting, all goes down to the city of Houston level. You collect the money get the fine, get the court costs, so that people are not paying bondsmen and lawyers at the county? Well, first of all, we don't make arrests just to collect the money, <laughs> <laughs> number one. We want to uh, actually alleviate or, or discourage criminal activity. Uh, you got to remember uh, from our uh, student government classes, the police are part of the executive branch. So we actually enforce what as legislators and whether that's state, federal, or local uh, elected officials enact. For me to make those or arrest as Class C, obviously I have to have the blessing of the Harris County District Attorney's Office in this case. So it, that's, that's a debate that should be done with the citizens of Houston. And certainly uh, we have to understand that Class C misdemeanor arrests are a large number. Right now, the city of Houston only have two jail facilities. If we're going to increase the number of prisoners that fall in those categories, how am I going to house them? Well, this is just tickets. This well, is tickets, still. and uh, nobody goes to jail. They just have mm -hmm. to go to court, have to pay a fine. 
uh, why not us collect the money? Is my point. Well, I mean, many you're, occasions you're, you're, that we'd rather have that money than lay off police officers. Yeah, when, when, and cut when, overtime. When you do find people with those type of arrests, small amounts of marijuana or paraphernalia, sometimes they're wanted on other charges, outstanding warrants, and those things, and we have to take them in. But certainly, uh, you, you know, it's not that I'm opposed to it. But but there's some other pieces to the system that has to be in place. We'll talk to the DA about this <laughs> next. Uh, <laughs> we'll bring her and, on the and, show. That's right. And Chief Garrison had some interaction with our district attorney when the unfortunate event occurred where the four children lost their lives. Yes. Uh, and you announced that actually, bravely, I thought, that your department may have made some mistakes rather than the district attorney's office who didn't pursue charges quickly enough. Well, I said what the mistake was, was we trusted Mrs. T Ms. Tata. That was our mistake. And really, we need to work better. There's no doubt about it. We need to work better. We need to work closer. And we should have realized early on that there was an opportunity for her to be on the move somehow. And we didn't do that. That was our mistake. Um, it, it was kind of, uh, for me, being new to the city of Houston and, and the back and forth that was, was attempting to be created between the, the district attorney's office and the uh, fire department, it seemed like that was almost purposeful in the, in the media because that wasn't what was taking place behind the scenes. We were all working together. So as that kind of, uh, mm. kind of started to rise up, um, I think that's when we said, "Hope we need to get together because this is getting away from us." We certainly don't want to don't, do not want to make it seem like we're not working together to get this moving forward. So I went over and I met with her and her staff. Met with yes, yes, the DA. Yes, I met with her. We met the, the uh, just a few days later, and we got on the same page and and we really um, developed our plan and we put all our cards on the table, and we said, hey, we're going to work together in the future. In fact, uh, her staff right now is teaching some classes to, the, to our arson investigators to try to make us better at what we do so we can support what they do because that really is one of those supporting pieces back and forth. And uh, that really did get kind of flared up um, a lot bigger in the media than it was really happening behind the scenes. And the, it, that was unfortunate. So the DA didn't chew him out is what I'm yeah. asking. No, in fact, she was, <laughs> she was uh, extremely pleasant. And um, we, we met and we talked about all the issues. And, and it, was, it was interesting how somebody can, can do something so tragic and the focus not beyond that person and the tragedy itself, and all of a sudden the focus is on these two agencies not getting along. Really, that was not the case at all. Well, that's the media for you. Uh, <laughs> Chief, uh, challenges for the Houston Police Department as we look, look forward for the next couple of years. Well, uh, budget and staffing is certainly going to be a challenge. Uh, we actually need to uh, use uh, uh, technology as a force multiplier because when we have staffing challenges, we have to find ways to increase our technology. So uh, going forward, we have to solve radio interoperability. So I believe crime is regional. And all the law enforcement agencies in this region must be able to talk, communicate, and share information together. Uh, there's a, a huge homeland security obligation in this area. Houston has nine critical infrastructures that have to be protected, more than New York. So an HPD can't do it alone. Uh, the other challenge, uh, Chief, uh, excuse me, because, you know, we're short of time and we have to get this part in, that you raised in your article that you wrote for the Chronicle recently has to do with the confidence of the public yes. in the Houston Police Department, given <clears throat> the beating of the, of the youngster that was, on, uh, that was filmed. Yes. Uh, you have not actually been able to discipline well, not you, just you, but other police uh, chiefs, because of a arbitration system that really rewards the wrongdoers, you can't uh, you can't get control of your department. It seems with those types of disciplinary procedures that we have in Houston. Well, let me say this: uh, Yes, I did take swift and, and uh, decisive disciplinary action in that case, and those officers uh, that were involved that uh, acted egregiously were fired. Now, certainly in their appeal process and due process rights, they can appeal to arbitration. And, uh, you know, sometimes an arbitration may not rule uh, the way that I decided, and, and that's a challenge. But clearly, yes, our police community relationship, you know, did take a, a, a setback. And, uh, but I can tell you this, that the community solidly supports the Houston Police Department. And many of the community, community leaders that have been outspoken and criticized the Houston Police Department those particular neighborhoods saw some of the most dramatic decreases in violent crime. 
So I should be happy. Uh, <laughs> Chief Garrison, yes, one sir. of the things I know, I, was, I, I traveled overseas uh, in February and I noticed I was in a major world city that had cameras everywhere. I mean, I'm everywhere, mm -hmm. sidewalks, streets, I mean, all over the place. Is that uh, along the lines of what Chief McClellan's talked about? Is this kind of the future for public safety to use automation, cameras, red light cameras, and the like to, <laughs> well, to, 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 it, hmm. to expand your abilities to do your job? You know what? We, we actually need to use technology in all aspects of our job. In our prevention piece, if we, can, if we can prevent fires or emergencies somehow on the front end, if we can mitigate those, those uh, disasters. The biggest piece for us is our radio technology, is we are way behind on radio technology. So we're trying to catch up with that. And then we're how we move into the hazard zone. You can imagine somebody with a cell phone, your kid has a cell phone, you know exactly where they are any time of the day. We send people into fires, many, many fires into firefighters into a fire, and you don't know exactly where they're at. So we're getting better at how do you manage hazard zone operations when you actually go inside those uh Difficult situations. Very good. Well, well, you know, Gary always looks to China for solutions to her problems, it seems. <laughs> Actually, that was Australia that had the cameras everywhere, anyway, David. Anyway, thank you guys, <laughs> Chiefs. We appreciate you being here. Thank, thank you. you. We invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Click on the local program bar at Red, White, and Blue. Read about the guests, follow-up discussions. And until next time, get informed and get active.